thank you for that introduction and thank you for um, the organisers for inviting me to uh, come and talk to you today on this topic. Um, I, as you can see, I've had a long life of experience of marriage, but it's actually not something I've reflected much upon as a theologian. I've um, tended to leave that to other colleagues, but I think I have a few interesting things to say and I hope you find them that way today. So let's begin by asking a question, what is marriage? What does marriage mean? If we were posed to pose this question to the proverbial person in the street, we'd come up with a variety of responses. Marriage is about love and commitment, about family and children, fidelity to one another, companionship and so on. Some might see it as an outdated institution, or if the person in the street happened to be Catholic, they might say marriage is a sacrament. Indeed, we face an increasingly complex array of views about marriage. Some groups continue a very traditional understanding of marriage as primarily a social reality organised by a parent's couple. So even in Australia, we still see arranged marriages being occurring. Others call for legal recognition of gay and lesbian relationships as equivalent to marriage, with all the incumbent rights, such as adoption, inheritance, access to IVF, and so on. For some young people, there seemed to be a growing unwillingness to commit to marriage, with de facto relationships are living together on the rise. In fact, a colleague of mine, one of my ex-students, was uh, he works in marriage education, and uh, when they have people come to do the marriage education, they have to fill in a, uh, a you know a statement of uh, or fill in forms of you know, and on that he'd say seventy percent of people coming to marriage in the Catholic Church would already be living together, uh, so that's become just about normal uh, in in the present situation. Perhaps more than ever, many are aware of the fragility of marriage due to the divorce of parents, family members and friends. Despite all this complexity, people still want to be in relationship. They want companionship and to be able to express their sexual desires. But there's also a fear, a fear regarding the pain of broken commitment, a violated trust that marriage may also entail. If we go back to our question and the sort of answers we might get, we can notice that many of the things that we associate with marriage, love, commitment, family, children and relationship, companionship and so on, would hold true whether we were religious or not. All people, regardless of their religious beliefs or philosophies, might see these things as desirable. So when we claim that marriage is a sacrament, what exactly are we saying and what difference does it make? This observation is of course related to the history of marriage as well, or reflected in that. As an institution, marriage predates the arrival of the church by thousands of years. For as long as there have been human societies, there have been an interest in regulating and maintaining marriage as a social institution from taboos which restrict possible mar marriage partners to the concerns of inheritance and offspring and so on. For the wealthy, marriage was often a way of cementing alliances between families. For the poor, marriage meant children to assist in the task of survival and security in old age. <coughs> the church's involvement in marriage has its own history. While Jesus had some very pointed things to say about divorce, the early church did not see itself as having a role in the regulation of marriage. While blessings and prayers were offered in various settings, there was not a liturgy of marriage as we now have it. So the people married according to the secular customs of the day. It was only in the Middle Ages, so 12, about 1,200 years ago, that the church began to have a major, a major role in the regulation of marriage 
and began to talk consistently of marriage as a sacrament. What had begun as a largely social reality now became a permanent feature of the church's sacramental understanding of the Christian life. As a sacrament, marriage is viewed, as Brian pointed out so beautifully this morning, as a concrete expression of God's graciousness to humanity. The man and the woman symbolises God's freely entering into a covenant with humanity through the person of Jesus and embodied in the church. Through the grace the sacrament offers, the married couple work out their salvation in the sight of God. Central to that sacramental understanding are the claims that marriage involves get this right, marriage involves an exclusive and permanent commitment to one's marriage partner. Claims constantly held since the original teaching of Jesus that this was a permanent commitment, an exclusive commitment. Now such a claim is perhaps incredible in a society such as ours where nearly 30% of marriages end in separation after five years and another 20% in the next five years. Social commentators often refer to the present scene as one of serial monogamy. In some sense, a marriage is as popular as ever. Though the failure rate is high, people often begin another marriage in a year or two. Uh, after the previous marriage breakup, in the hope of finding the right partner, as Brian again mentioned before, or a more lasting relationship. Today, long-lasting marriages are more a rarity than they were in the past. In fact, one of the things I enjoy about our parish, and we had this uh, only a couple of weeks ago, was the celebration of people's marriages within the parish setting. So we have an annual mass whereby <coughs> people who've been married for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 45, and this year we had someone 60 years married. Uh, it was just amazing, just amazing to be able to see that uh, and celebrate that in a parish setting. So marriage is a complex reality. It encompasses a range of human experiences and needs. And what I want to do today is unpack some of that complexity so that we can understand some of the components that go into making up a marriage, so that we can see how marriage might be strengthened and fostered and truly valued. An initial observation then is in the way in which marriage involves us in the vitality, the biological energy of life, evident in human sexuality and procreation. And again, Brian mentioned this. Sexual activity brings with it a sense of well-being, of shared bodily pleasure, tension released. We know that sexual activity releases various chemicals in our brain and that these make us feel more relaxed and at ease with one another. There can be positive health benefits to sexual activity, contributing to our sense of vitality. Sexual activity can also bring us a sense of groundedness, of the goodness of the body, a strong awareness of ourselves as physical beings. However, there are also powerful instinctive forces at work which cannot be ignored, biologically orienting us to the continuation of our species, to procreation. While procreation is not the sole determinative of the meaning of sexual activity, and again, I think Brian brought it out well, it does provide an element that cannot be ignored. Catholic teaching, of course, affirms the intimate connection between sexual activity and procreation. Now these vital values of pleasure, physical well-being and procreation are good in themselves, but they need to be integrated within and subordinate to a higher good which places them within a context of more important concerns. 
this may require some sacrifice of some of these values for that greater good. So a couple may need to regulate their procreative activity for sound financial reasons in an era when the raising of children is a major financial commitment or for health reasons where one or other partner is unwell. Now no one can deny the physical power of sexual release and its strong ties to these biologically instinctive forces, though we're rarely fully conscious of them. Its power can lead to addictive compulsive behaviours, often now associated with internet pornography, which they say is just completely out of control. Sexual activity can be linked with a drive for dominance, for power over another, as in rape and other forms of sexual abuse. Traditional, tradition, sorry, traditional suspicion regarding the pleasure of sexuality was perhaps informed by this type of negative experience, this darkness of sexuality. As a result, sexuality and bodiliness have been tended to be viewed with suspicion, even within our own Christian tradition. In fact, this suspicion does nothing to heal that compulsive force of sexual energy. Rather, it feeds into it. One may renounce sexual activity for higher goals, but certainly not on the basis of identifying it as evil. <coughs> now, our society has a strong sense of the goodness of sexuality, often to a naive extent that ignores its darker aspects, or worse still, is actually attracted by them. What we often lack is the recognition that such activity needs to be in integrated within and subordinated into a higher context of stability, companionship, love and family to find its natural home. The endless search for sexual partners and novel sexual experiences as we often see in TV shows and films is a futile dead end that can undermine the deeper search for meaning and personal fulfilment in a life well led. Now if these experiences of vitality of life are to be achieved in an orderly fashion, there needs to be a higher process, a higher institution which orders them. In the first instance then, marriage is this overarching social institution in relationship to the values of sexual activity and procreation. In marriage, sexual activity becomes sexual relationship, a partnership between two persons designed to meet a range of social and economic goals, building a house, a family, a life together. Family becomes the fundamental basis for society as a whole. It provides efficiencies, division of labour. Some people do this thing, other people do that. So there's a division of labour and a sharing of responsibility by which a man and a woman can enter into a partnership which meets their needs for intimacy, shelter, food and the needs of children that are the fruit of that relationship. In many societies, and again Brian illustrated this from uh, Old Testament examples, it's not simply the union of a man and a woman, but the bringing together of two families into a wider social network of relationship, which then strengthens society as a whole. Hence, even to today, marriages are, can be arranged in some cultures, irrespective of the desires of the couple. And I remember when, when Brian was um, giving that story of um, Jewish marriage rights, and you're probably all familiar with um, Fiddler on the Roof. People familiar with the story of Fiddler on the Roof, very Jewish story. But that transition from a society where marriage is almost completely organised by the parents to a society in which people begin to marry out of love. And the crucial question that he asks his wife, do you love me? Know, they'd been married, they'd never seen one another, they were married when they were children. And they'd grown up together, they'd been married for 30, 40 years, 
and he asked, so do you love me? Uh, that sort of sh cultural shift that we're so much a part of, but certainly in some of those societies, marriage was simply that sort of social construct. Now, here it's intended that society provides a framework of support to ensure the overall permanence of marriage. So that sort of network of relationships helps pr provide that sort of uh, infrastructure to ensure that marriage remains permanent. Now the stability of marriage becomes the context within, within which children are not only conceived, but nurtured, fed, sheltered and educated. Without that permanence of marriage, it's difficult to provide the resources needed to nurture and educate children. And again, this is just really very practical stuff, but we know it. Uh, those of you who've had four adult children grow up, uh, the costs of supporting that, of nurturing those, those children, the, the sporting activities, the educational activities into university, this is a major commitment, a major financial commitment. <coughs> These days, especially as uh, more and more educated is needed in order for people to contribute to the society, the costs are really significant. In fact, they're enormous, in fact. And we can see here also the problem associated with premarital sex, where despite whatever precautions people may take, new life does begin, can begin. And without those clearer prospects of a stable bonded relationship, the future nurturing of children can be far from assured. And so sexual activity in such circumstances can be irresponsible. Nonetheless, this argument for permanence is not absolute. Permanence is required to protect the good of the partners and their offspring but it is precisely these values which may be placed at risk when one partner, and it's usually the male, is violent towards the other partner, or misuses the economic resources of the family through various addictions, or physically or sexually abuses the children. Under such circumstances, it would make sense to break the marriage relationship. Now, this has other consequences in terms of remarriage and stuff like that. I'm not going to talk about that. But breaking the relationship may be preferable to staying in a destructive relationship which risks the physical and psychological, uh, <coughs> which risks physical and psychological damage, particularly to the children. Uh, increasing evidence, and my wife is uh, more the expert in this, but um, of the impact of domestic violence on children that even witnessing violence can, uh, can cause uh, post-traumatic stress in children, which can then affect them for the rest of their lives. So these are, these are really damaging. One of the primary difficulties facing marriage in the present situation is this focus on these practical necessities of employment and housing. What's the cost of a house in Sydney? What puts more strain on a married relationship than having to put together a mortgage, and paying off a mortgage and so on? Um, again, I'm pleased now, all my, all my kids are in some sort of uh, uh, into the property market, but getting children into that property market is a very, very difficult thing in our situation. Family units are often dispersed, so I have a one of my kids is in, uh, San, in uh, Los Angeles at present. Um, and that undermines the network of social support which help keep a marriage <coughs> together, particularly in mobile societies as ours where people need to move for employment and housing. So when you know, the governments say things, I won't be too political, but when governments say things like, oh, well, people should travel for work. Mm -hmm. They should go into state borders. Well, what's the impact then on those family networks and relationships and the support that marriage needs in those sort of situations? Subsequently, many marriages face severe tensions which might otherwise be allayed by pr proper family support structures. And we can see why marriage as a whole has an, uh, sorry, why society as a whole has an interest in the regulation of marriage 
Marriage is not just a private affair. The breakdown of marriage impacts on the economic and psychological well-being of the family participants. Where such breakdown is widespread, as it is in our society, it can work to undermine the common good of society. Resources are needed to assist those who suffer the consequences. But also, with less formal de facto situation, uh, sorry, in recent times, society has even taken measures to support um, sorry, I've just lost my place here. This is part of the adjusting to a new pair of glasses, <laughs> which um, I'm finding a little bit difficult. So, uh, in recent times, society has taken measures not only in regard to formal marriages, but also less formal de facto situations to protect the rights, particularly of women and children, after breakdowns in relationships. On the other hand, strong family life provides stability and harmony in society. So, as, so it's good in that sense that governments seek to assist families through taxation and other welfare benefits. However, the public nature of marriage is not just to protect the common good of society. It also helps protect those who enter into the relationship. By clarifying the nature of the relationship, Public commitment helps create a space for the couple which others are then called on to respect. This is important not only to protect the relationship from outside intrusion, but also to protect the couple themselves from the indeterminacy of their situation. While people may today prefer de facto relationships, the sociological data indicates that these suffer from higher rates of breakdown and particularly domestic violence than married relationships. Now I want to start talking now about marriage as meaning. And again, Brian spoke about this in terms of the narratives or stories that we tell ourselves about marriage. From what has been said, we can see that marriage is an important social reality. But more than that, it's a way of making sense out of our living. It gives our lives meaning and purpose. As children grow up, they shape their anticipations of their future in terms of marriage and family life shared with a loved partner. Marriage is a state of happily ever after to which we aspire so that no one enters into a marriage telling themselves that it'll all end in five or ten years' time. That's just a really odd way of thinking. Though now increasingly with the high, whole idea of prenups and stuff, it indicates that you know, people are almost planning to divorce, which is uh, just bizarre. Marriage helps us make sense of our life as partner, provider, homemaker, parent. Symbols which pertain to our sense of identity and purpose in the community. This is who we are. This is our identity. It's more difficult for a single person to find the same sense of meaning than those who are married. It provides that structure, a narrative, a story to tell. The single person must map out his or her life individually with less clearly identified role models. While the meaning of married life is largely ready-made, something we can take on, culturally acknowledged and valued to some extent and supported. Still, this meaning is not fixed. Gender roles in society and in marriage can and have shifted significantly in the last hundred years. Rarely today is the father the sole breadwinner not simply out of economic need, but because women have access to further education and careers. Women's sources of meaning cannot be confined to the duties of the home as they develop other dimensions of their lives, particularly as children go, grow older and are in less need of basic nurturing. Men too are called upon to find new meaning in fathering of their children as they take on, sorry, as they take on more nurturing roles within the family unit. The 
meaning of married life is not so clear cut. And we find ourselves with many alternative models being explored. The meaning of married life is less well defined for us than it was for our parents. This creates tensions too. High divorce rates, blended families, childless families, or childless marriages by choice, not by biological accident. Homosexual unions all stretch and perhaps question the meanings we find in marriage. The sh these shifting meanings place added tensions within marriages as couple may be operating out of quite different and competing meanings of what it is to be married. And these differing and competing uh, marriage uh, meetings can also be present within each partner individually, particularly when people come from different cultures. So when you've got marriages across different cultures, then there can be issues about how we construct what we think meaning is about. Gender roles are one of the major areas of tensions here as one partner slips into defined roles or another one pushes up against the limits of those roles in ways that run counter to current expectations of gender equality within relationships. So the whole negotiating of that is part of that meaning making within marriage. Now people who marry take on a commitment, whether they know it or not, they take on a commitment to contribute to the meaning of marriage. You are all, we are all cultural agents who incarnate a particular meaning of marriage. We live it out as a model for others upholding the meaning of their marriage not only for themselves but for the rest of society. This is another reason why the dissolution of marriage is more than an individual <coughs> matter between two people. It reverberates through the culture as a counter symbol to the stability of marriage. If widespread, then the expectation can become the norm, or the exception can become the norm, as expected outcome of a disposable society. This raises the stakes concerning the permanence of marriage beyond the social considerations above. The success and failure of people's marriages can lead to hope or despair for others struggling with their own situations. Uh, we had a a couple that we knew, uh, who's a good friend of mine, they'd been married for 20 years, had a couple of kids, so, and they decided that the marriage, they'd, there was no violence, there was no, they just decided that they were uh, going to separate. It was all very civilised. They actually had a party <laughs> to announce their, that they were separating. They invited us to this party, and I just couldn't go. I thought there was something fundamentally wrong-headed about this sort of, let's, okay, we're, we're just going to separate. You know, we have no particular reason, but no particular reason to stay together. It was a very sad situation, I felt. So, let's talk about marriage and commitment. While we're all the products of our social and cultural environment, there remains a core of freedom within each human being which transcends that environment. Through our freedom we give of our very selves through the commitments we undertake, the decisions we make and the values we uphold. It's here we can, say, we can begin to view something of the full reality of marriage as a free commitment, and again Brian spoke about this, to the well-being of another person who is lovable whatever his or her circumstances, in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad. It involves a recognition of, acceptance of, and commitment to the value of another person, which is responded to by the other person with a similar recognition, a similar acceptance and commitment. Of its very nature, it must be freely given. In the totality of the claims it makes on both partners, and it excludes other such commitments. 
both engage in this commitment as a fundamental moral act enacted in the marriage promise. Given the complete uncertainty of what the future might hold, it's one of the boldest things any of us ever does. Think about that when you know, your own married. This is an amazingly bold thing to say, that I will commit myself to this person, regardless <coughs> of whatever may happen. Of course, we can ask ourselves whether anyone entering into marriage is really aware of what it is that they are undertaking. Were you aware? <coughs> Did we really know what it would all involve? Uh, we were, uh, my wife was 21, I was 23. You have no idea what you're taking on, but you just go with it. It unfolds. As the reality of marriage becomes more complex, as the social support for marriage diminishes, entry into marriage commitment demands increasing levels of maturity on the part of marriage partners. Now it's this level of personal commitment that the permanence and exclusivity of marriage is most evident. Only a permanent and exclusive commitment is equal to the value that the partner has. It would be scandalous to walk away from such a commitment because of the sickness of the other or some other ill fortune. There's a lovely video clip that we saw before of that type of commitment. It would be a breach of that commitment to now allow another relationship to distract one from one's marriage promise. And any form of domestic violence is a clear and fundamental violation of the marriage commitment. Still, such a marriage commitment is most demanding. It requires us to grow as persons, to be challenged about one's limitations, to suffer the limitations of the other while encouraging them to grow. It must face stresses and strains, financial and emotional, to bring up a family. It's deserving of support from the extended family and society at large. But at base, it is a fundamental and personal commitment and demands profound personal orientation in each partner. Inevitably, it will run into difficulties. For example, one respect partner not respecting the other, not taking responsibility for the relationship, blaming the other, a refusal or an inability to grow. While the personal dimension of marriage is the most powerful indicator of its permanence, this is why marriage must be permanent, it also identifies the central cause of breakdown in personal moral failure and limitation. Hence Jesus is identifying of hardness of heart as the reason Moses allowed divorce. And the disciples' response that it is advisable not to marry in light of Jesus' own stance on the permanence of marriage. Nonetheless, the failure or limitation of the sinner is never the last word. Only in the context of divine grace is fidelity to marriage vows realisable. As Jesus says in a similar context, by human resources this is impossible, but for God everything is possible. But this then takes us into the religious realm, which we'll talk about soon. Now this notion of marriage as personal commitment is a major focus of modern marriage, as Brian indicated. Whereas in the sweep of human history, people have married for a variety of social and economic reasons. Today, people largely married out of love. They want to make a commitment to their chosen partner and nothing else really matters to them. This is a significant shift in the meaning of marriage. One whose historical roots lie in the church's own recognition of marriage as a sacrament. By sacramentalizing marriage, the church recognized the fundamental dimension 
a personal dimension of the relationship since sacraments can only be undertaken freely. While parents can organise a marriage in those sort of primitive societies, often the personal commitment has nothing to do with it, but you cannot have a sacrament without a personal commitment. It's central. But it's a morally demanding position to hold while the social and cultural level are not supportive as in the past in, a, uh, in maintaining that personal commitment. So it's not surprising that uh, marriages falter more commonly now. To finish off, we should talk about marriage and grace. Well, we're ready, we've noted two ways in which the religious dimension can assist in realising the full va value of marriage. In terms of providing meaning and purpose, religious faith can help revitalise our expectations of marriage. So they do not view it as the sole source of our salvation, a salvation which comes properly from God. Without this faith dimension, people can simply expect too much. Marriage isn't the whole of life. It's a very, very important part, but in the end, it's within a larger religious context that, that um, becomes realisable. Next, the grace of forgiveness is essential. It's an essential element if marriage is to survive the inevitable crises that arise from the moral failure of the couple. However, more can be said. The biblical tradition long used marriage as a symbol for God's relationship to his people. In the Old Testament, Israel is viewed as an unfaithful wife and the covenant is likened to a marriage bond between Yahweh and his chosen bride. In the New Testament, the, marriage, the, the relationship between Christ and his church is seen as analogous to that of the married couple. Marriage is an act of election, a choice. It does not say this person is more important, beautiful or good or whatever other characteristic you want to put on than any other person. It says I choose you to be of special value to me. I commit myself to you. This is a gracious act and it's analogous to the gracious act of God evident in his dealings with the people of Israel and fully realised in Christ. It is this analogy which in the final analysis leads to a Christian view of marriage as permanent commitment. God is always faithful to the chosen people. Christ is always faithful to his church. So too the fidelity of the marriage commitment is not based on whether this person, my partner, satisfies my present needs, but on the symbolic analogy between the marriage bond and the divine fidelity to human salvation. This does not mean that a couple must stay together at all costs, particularly where there's violence in the relationship. But ideally, the church urges people in such situations not to remarry as a sign of their continuing fidelity. In viewing marriage as a sacrament, we recognise that this fundamental human reality is the arena of our salvation, the fundamental drama of our life that without grace we will fail, but that God's grace is promised. It is offered so that our failures are not the last word and that forgiveness is possible. There is a horizon beyond our imaginings opening up to us through the gift that God offers. In sacramentalising marriage, the church does not present an idealised version of marriage, which no one can attain, a marriage without problems, conflicts or even disasters. Indeed, it is a fundamentally realistic assessment that all marriages will face such difficulties and are incapable of solving them in a way which preserves the dignity and self-esteem of the couple without a source of love, compassion and forgiveness which goes beyond those of the couple themselves. 
and further the way in which we address these problems, these conflicts and disasters, is the very stuff of our salvation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Ulmer. Uh